Galatians chapter 6, let's just go straight there. What's the time? 10.55. We'll dive straight into this. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 to 9. We talked a couple of weeks ago uh, about uh, not growing weary in doing good. It says in due time that you'll reap a harvest. I want to sort of dance around that idea a little bit this morning and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully encourage some of us because how many of you know that uh, there's a lot of good things that we could be doing in the world? Uh, there are things that God has said to us through his word and there are things that God is saying to us through his Holy Spirit, personal things that he's speaking to us, decisions to be made, things where he's speaking to us about our hearts, stuff to let go of, stuff to pick up, directions to change, courses of action and so on. And how many of you know it's not easy? Who, who knows it's not easy following God? Yeah? I, when I got saved, it was, it was right around, I didn't know this at the time, but it kind of, because I wasn't in a church space, but it was right around that time where, where the preachers were preaching that if you come to Jesus, you'll never have a problem. Uh, all your worries are gone. He'll give you my... I remember being in India, actually, after I got saved, went to India as a missionary, standing in a village and having a preacher tell these poor people in an Indian slum, come to Jesus. You want a job? Come to Jesus. You want money? Come to Jesus. You want... Come... And he just basically told them every material, natural thing that they could possibly want. If they came to faith, then God would give them all these material, natural things. And of course, as you can imagine, every person in that village would put their hand up then and go, yeah, I, I want to come to Jesus. But uh, as time goes on, when all that stuff didn't come, we kind of feel like we've been ripped off a little bit, like that was not in the brochure. You sold me something. Anyone ever bought a product online or bought a product in a store, you get it home, and you realize that's actually not what you were told it was. Anyone ever done that? That actually doesn't do what the salesman told you it would do. You know, And we get angry and we get frustrated at that. And uh, people have a right to be disappointed when they're sold one thing about Jesus and they're told. Jesus himself in John 16 said, in this world you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble. There's going to be difficulties. But he said, but don't fear, I've overcome the world. And I place within you my spirit, and by my spirit you can overcome the things of this world too. Overcoming the things of this world means that in order to overcome, I've got to have something to overcome, right? There's going to be things there. There are going to be trials. There are going to be situations that come into our world. And so we were talking about uh, not growing weary in, in doing good because it can be tiring when we're not seeing the fruit or the results of whatever it is that we're laboring for, whatever it is that we're praying for, whatever it is that we're believing for, whatever it is that we're taking steps towards. So this Christian life is it's like a marathon, isn't it? Uh, when you start a marathon, you can't see the, the end. You know, um, oh, you would know this because you run marathons every morning before breakfast, apparently. Now, I don't run marathons. I'm a sprinter. I prefer short, sharp, whenever, wherever my feet start, if I can't see where they're ending, I'm not going to run that race. It's over, right? I've got to see the finish line, then bang, big burst of energy, boom, I'm there. It starts, it's over. It's a short period of time. The recovery is way longer than the actual event is. But marathon runners like you, you're crazy. I don't get it. These guys, you, don't, you, the, 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 you can't see the finish line. You're going to run for hours and hours and hours and then the recovery time you know I'm, I'm sure you probably get a chance to sit there afterwards have a, a drink of water or something and after 10 minutes Stacey's going well come on let's go we've got to, we're going shopping or something and you, you're straight out moving on to the next thing well this Christian life is like a marathon it's a it's a long road it's a long road it's not a short sprint it's a long road and it can get tiring on this journey, especially when we're believing for things God has said and God has spoken to us and so on. And so we were looking at, at not growing weary and doing good. I just want to chuck a thought, another couple of thoughts sort of on, on, on top of that and, and broaden that, um, that passage a little bit. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 to 9. And here's what Paul writes. He says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he'll also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption... But he who sows to the Spirit will the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we will reap a harvest if we do not lose heart. Uh, do not be deceived. He starts by saying to the Galatians, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. That word mocked in the Greek, it literally means to, to turn your nose up at. Right? So I'm going to paint you a picture of what it means in the Greek language. Let's say I'm glad you're here today, Rodney. And I'm glad you're here today, Robert. Two golfers, right? Now I want you to imagine, Robert. Rodney comes over to you and goes, I went around Royal Teven, golf course as it's called now. Royal Teven, is it still nine holes? I went around Royal Teven in 18 shots, Rob. Now what are you going to do? Rob, you know what you're going to do? You're going to turn your nose up at him and turn away. Because you know that there's no way on planet Earth that you don't believe a word that he said when he comes to you. and Isn't that right? Right? Eh? 
Is that right? You're not going to believe a word of that when he comes and says, I went around Royal Teven in 18 hells. You're going to turn your nose up and snub him. Why? Hey? Oh, look, stop making excuses. Hey, stop making excuses, okay? He still tells everyone he's a great golfer, even at 82. You look great for 82, by the way, Rod. 82. Um, but you're not going to believe that. You're, you're going you're to turn your nose up at that. Why are you turning your nose up? Why are you snubbing that? It's because you actually don't believe what Rodney had to say, right? And that's the picture here. This is what Paul is saying to the Galatians. He's saying, don't be deceived. Don't snub your nose at God. A man reaps what he sows. What he's saying is that's actually a spiritual fact. What you sow, you're going to reap. And he's saying, don't, don't be deceived. Don't be, don't be led astray in your thinking in your mind. Don't be led up the garden path to think that that doesn't apply to you, that it's not real for you. He says, no, no, don't be deceived. Don't thumb your nose at God. Don't turn your nose up at God when he says you'll reap what you sow because it's a fact. You're going to reap what you sow in life. You're going to reap what you sow in life. Now, when we talk about reaping and sowing, we've kind of had a church culture in recent years in the West. We're getting better at it now. We're moving out of this. But it used to be uh, reaping and sowing, we'd straight away think of, of money, right? If I give $10, I'll get $1,000 back, you know? If I give... And, and, and maybe Paul was aware back then that if, I, if we say reaping and sowing, people will nail it down to a particular type or a particular thing. And so he kind of broadens it here and gives a bit more perspective. He says, don't be deceived. God's not mocked. In other words, believe it when God says, a man reaps what he sows. And then he says this, for he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. So he says, what God is saying about reaping what you sow is true. What you put, what you invest and what you cultivate in your life, that's what's going to grow in your life. This is the point he's making. Whatever you cultivate, whatever you, 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 you plant and you tend to and so on, whatever you feed into, whatever you give yourself over to in your life, that's the thing in your life that's actually going to grow. What you cultivate will grow. And he says there's basically two things in life that you sow into and that you reap out of. He says you either sow into the flesh and out of that you reap corruption. Or he says you're going to be a kind of person that sows into the spirit and out of that you're going to reap eternal life. Now, when we talk about sowing into the spirit or sowing into the flesh, I want you to kind of think about what characteristics and things in your life, whatever you nurture, whatever you sow into, whatever you give yourself over to, those impulses, those inclinations, they're the things that you're harvesting. They're the things that you're cultivating. They're the things that you're giving yourself over to. Therefore, they're the things that at the end of the day, you will reap into your life. Let me give you a natural example of of reaping to the flesh and sowing uh, 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 destruction. Think about people that struggle with, uh, uh, say, substance abuse. Say, think about somebody that is, is, is addicted to alcohol or to, to drug addiction or some form of addiction. That's an easy destruction for us to see. We look at their lives and we see the toll it takes on them physically. Family and friends around, you see the toll physically that's taking on their bodies. You see the toll that it's taking on their mind. You see the toll that it takes on their families. There's no money there because, you know, it all got spent here and spent there. When I, when I grew up, we had some problems in my uh, family, my upbringing. And one of my parents would, would grab the, the, the paycheck back when it used to come in an envelope, remember? Before, you know, everything went online and that. it used to be in a piece of paper and they put the money. And, and one of my parents would go to my, my, the, the, the place, my, the boss of my other parent, I've only got a mum and a dad, so you pick. Grab the money and then would go and gamble that money away and drink that money away. And then so for the rest of the week, because of that, the evidence of that destruction played out in the whole family. And so there are areas of destruction where we can see it plain as day. When people are sowing to that fleshly side of the world, we see the, 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 the corruption, we see the destruction that takes place in their life and in the world around them. They can't hold down jobs because they're, you know, you're know you getting tanked one night and you're sleeping all day and you're missing work and so on. And There's this evidence, evident corruption. But there's other sorts of corruption when we give, because we can give in to the flesh and nobody else can know about it. Isn't that right? We can be privately giving into the flesh and cultivating that side of our life and nobody needs to know about it. We can be doing it on the quiet, on the side. We can be coming to church, putting on our mask, hallelujah, praise God, we're all great. But when we walk out the doors and nobody's around, we can be doing and engaging and involving ourselves in all kinds of destructive things that we know are not investing and sowing into the spirit. We know they're sowing into the flesh. 
And so we can have the destructive types of stuff in our life too that nobody else sees, such as the shame that we carry around with ourselves. Because we know I'm one thing here, but I'm something totally different over there. And we battle shame in our lives. Or we battle guilt. We, we, we carry guilt and condemnation around because we know this is what I am out there, but this is what I am here. And it's a result of sowing or cultivating, as Paul says, if you sow to the flesh, then from that you'll reap destruction and corruption in your life. But he says, but if you sow to the Spirit, and of course we all know in this room the ultimate corruption, the ultimate destruction, if you keep sowing down that path, the ultimate corruption is, of course, one day we're all going to stand before God. One day we're all going to stand before the creator of the universe. We're going to stand before a God. We're going to look at him and we're going to see and we're going to realize the love and the grace and the mercy and the compassion and the forgiveness and all this stuff that he had already purchased for us. He's already done everything that needs to be done for us to step into his love. He's done everything. And we're going to stand before him one day. We're going to see that. But he's going to say these words, depart from me. I didn't know you. I wanted to know you. I, 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 I came to you and I tried to, 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 you came to church one day and the guy up the front was talking about it. Your friend spoke to you one day about it. Uh, you, you turned on the radio and you happened to hear about this Jesus. You, you, you picked up a book and a guy was talking. Uh, and I, I tried to, to get your attention and to show you, but you consistently refused and said, no, 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 depart from me. I didn't know you. And that's the ultimate destruction of living an entire life that just cultivates and gives into the flesh. But Paul says there's another option, doesn't he? He says, but if you sow to the Spirit, he says, then of the Spirit, you'll reap eternal life. You, 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 you invest into the, that side of life. And then he goes on and he says, for, for he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. If you sow to the Spirit, of the Spirit, you'll reap eternal life. And he says, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season you'll reap a harvest. What's the doing good? Well, in a nutshell, the doing good is doing what God says to do. It's living life doing what God says to do. Let's not overcomplicate this Christian life. Let's not make it. He, go with me to, to Deuteronomy. It's funny, you say go with me in churches these days, and no one brings Bibles anyway, but we still say it. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. And, and, and I, I love this passage because, again, it's like God going, You guys are thickheads. So I'm just going to make things so simple for you that it's difficult for you to miss what I'm saying. And if you miss what I'm saying, you're going to have to work really hard at not understanding me because I'm going to speak your language, right? And here's, here's one of those passages. In Deuteronomy, after outlining, if you walk with me and live for me and so on, these are, you know, this is the kind of life I want for you. And over here is this other kind of life that I don't really want for you. But it's, there's a consequence for our actions, right? There are consequences for the things that we do. And he kind of outlines some of these consequences and life will go like this. And Now, let's, let's, let's keep in mind in the Old Testament, when it talks about blessing in Deuteronomy, God is the instigator of the blessing. When it talks about cursing in Deuteronomy, God is the instigation, instigator of the curse too, right? Now... In the New Covenant, I'm not saying that God is instigating curses upon us. I believe we're in the acceptable year of the Lord now and the Holy Spirit fell. So there is a difference there. But I want you to understand and see the simplicity of what he's saying because it overlaps here with what Paul is saying. So to the flesh, you'll reap destruction. So to the Spirit, and you'll reap eternal life. And here's what he says after explaining what life can be like with me and then explaining what life will be like without me. And then he gives us this call in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. I've set it before you. Here's life and here's death, right? Which one's more attractive? Which one does your inner self tell you is going to be better for you, life or death? It's a no-brainer. It's like going on, uh, who wants to be a millionaire and having Eddie Maguire say A, B, C, D. By the way, the answer is A, but you've still got to choose it. That's how simple this is, right? He says, I lay before you blessing and cursing, life and death. And then he says, therefore, choose life. He gives you the answer. He gives you the answer. Kids going through your HSC exams, don't you wish, don't you wish that somebody had walked in this room and given you the answer while you sat there struggling over the question? I don't know, is it Arthur or Martha? I don't know. Well, he's giving you the answer. I'm setting before you blessing, cursing, life and death. 
And I'm going to give you a tip. The answer is choose life. Why? That both you and your descendants may live. This option that's laid before us is a choice, is it not? Walking with God daily is a choice. Getting out of bed each day and continuing on this marathon called the Christian life, it's a choice. It's a choice. Deciding not to can also end up being a choice. Now, I know we all have circumstances and situations and things that come against us. And every day we have the option to choose to sow into that fleshly side of our life that we know wants to pull us against what we know God has said and is saying to us. We, we have that inner battle, you know, that the, oh, I, the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things I do want to do, I don't do, and who will save me from this body of death? We all struggle with that. We've all got that kind of stuff going on. But he makes it very clear to us. He says, if you continue to sow to the fleshly side of your life, you're going to reap destruction, people. It's going to catch up with you eventually. It's going to catch up with you eventually. Sometimes when I'm going through difficulties in my life, here's a question I ask myself. Is it possible right now that I'm reaping something from what I have sown already in my life? Is it possible that this thing I'm struggling with now, have I played a role in being here because I've cultivated the wrong stuff in my life? And, 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 and sowing into things that led me to this place. I'm not saying it's always the answer, but it's a valid question for me. Have I cultivated some of the stuff that's coming into my life right now? And right now, with the things that I'm feeding and cultivating in my life, am I feeding into and cultivating things that down the track are going to reap blessing into my world? Or am I right now engaging in things that down the track they will catch up with me? This is what Paul's saying. Don't be deceived. Don't kid yourself and think you're going to be the luckiest sinner in the world and it's never going to catch up with you. He says it's going to catch up with you. It either catches up with you in this life or it's going to catch up with you at the end of this life. But at some point, at some point, it's going to catch up with each and every one of us. Let us not grow weary while doing good. Let us not grow weary while doing good. He says in due time, in due time, we'll reap a harvest. Here's, here's what I know. The, the, the timing of the blessing or the timing of the reaping is not up to me. He says in due time. God has a time. I don't know the time. Okay? And this is what makes it sometimes so hard to continue doing good. If I knew the time, you know, if I knew the finish line was just there, then I'd just keep pushing those legs a little bit harder, keep exerting energy, because I knew exactly the time would be when I'd get the ribbon. Or, or not get the ribbon. No, well, everyone gets a ribbon these days. You can come last and you get a ribbon, don't you, these days? Because we can't have anybody losing anything, you know? But a marathon, it's very, very different. It's very different. And it says, don't grow weary. Because it says in due season, I don't determine the timing of when that comes back in the morning. I don't deserve, de determine the timing. And I don't necessarily determine the type. Remember? I, I, if I give, if, if I sow financially and give to the poor and give to missions and so on, with, with, with a narrow perspective that the only thing that'll bounce, until money bounces back, I'm not blessed. You're missing the point. He's not saying that's not it. I know that, that, that when I do good, when I obey God, when I live my life the way he wants me to, I make decisions each day based on what he has said in his word and what he is saying by his spirit. When I live my life that way, I know that blessing, I know that eternal life, I know that these things, they bounce into my world. I don't determine the timing when I experience that and I don't necessarily determine the type either. Maybe it's, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's the next time I go through a tough time, the joy and the peace that I'll face sailing through that next storm because of the good I did here. I don't know. He doesn't tell me very clearly if you do this, it's going to be that. It just says that it will happen. The timing's up to God and the type is up to God. But what I do have to, have to acknowledge and what I do see here, I do play a part though, and that is what am I cultivating? What am I actually cultivating? Because it's getting harder and harder and harder to live for Jesus, especially in the public spaces. I was talking to a guy last night at the wedding and he was talking about his vocation and what he, he does for a vocation. And he said, I'm, he's, he's, he's in his early 50s and he was saying, I'm rethinking what I've done my whole life because this public space that I work in with all the rules and changes and legislations coming in as a Christian, it's actually getting harder and harder to stay there. 
because of some of the things I'm, I can say and can't say, can do, can't do, some of the things I... And he, and he used these words. He said, some of the things that I have to feed in people, when I know that's not the answer. But I'm in this industry and I've got to toe the line, so to speak. So he said, I'm rethinking. Uh, what do I do? How do I think outside the box? How can I still use my gifting and so on, but, but be sowing something positive? And, and so anyway, he's wrestling um, with this stuff at the moment. But let us not grow weary. While doing good in due season, then we will reap a harvest. Here's the thing. Paul's trying to say this. No resilience, there's no reaping. No resilience, no reaping. No perseverance, no prize. No resilience, no reaping. Don't grow weary doing good. You've got to have resilience. You've got to persevere. We've got to have perseverance. It's perseverance and resilience. We live in a culture right now that are killing both of those in the younger generation right now. We are legislating perseverance and resilience out of our culture. Anything that, 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 anything that could offend you is becoming illegal. Anything that could make you think a, 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 a wrong way is becoming illegal. Anything that causes you to have to push through some embarrassment or some personal pain. It, it, people don't agree with you. It's almost becoming illegal to disagree. You can think that you don't agree, that's fine, but we cannot say to each other we don't agree. One of us will end up in prison. That's how ludicrous the world is getting. And what happens is eventually we don't have any resilience. We end up with a generation growing up uh, of, that have no resilience and no ability to persevere because all those things that teach you that as you grow up are getting removed. So we're going to end up with, 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 with a generation of adults that, if we're not careful, don't know. They don't know how to handle, and we're already seeing this, aren't we? Don't know how to handle it when things don't go their way. Because from the time they were this big, we were told, no, 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 everybody gets a ribbon at school. Nobody has to experience the, the, the fact that maybe somebody's faster than you, and that's okay, just deal with it. There's nothing actually wrong with that, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But and, and, and the person that worked hard and had that natural gifting or trained hard and was the, the, the winner in the high jump doesn't really experience the benefit and the joy of the hard work and the effort they put in either because the person that came last got the same ribbon as them. And, and it's, it's messed up. It's messed up. You go as far back as the Word of God, go right back to the beginning. There's something about perseverance and there's something about resilience. And we need perseverance and we need resilience. And Paul's saying here, don't grow weary in doing good. In other words, you've got to have some perseverance, got to have some grit, got to have some resilience. If you are going to live life as a Christian, if you're going to live for Jesus in this day and age, you've got to have something inside of you that keeps you going and keeps you going and keeps you going and keeps you going. Because if if you can be stopped, you will be stopped. If you can be made to grow weary, then you'll be made to grow weary. If I'm the devil, if I'm the devil and I know what your cutoff point is, I know that all I've got to do is apply a little bit of pressure and you'll back up. I'll run around applying pressure all day because I know I'll win because you've got no resilience. We don't have perseverance. This is what Paul is saying. Don't grow weary in doing good because in due time, in the right time, we're going to reap a harvest. One of the, I've got a list of reasons. I want to go into it now. I haven't got time, but typical Sunday. Don't grow weary in doing good because in due time you'll reap a harvest. In a nutshell, one of the biggest reasons why we grow weary in doing good is because we're not seeing or feeling like we're experiencing or laying a hold of whatever we think that prize is for doing good. When, 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 there are several cases. Go to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is written to a bunch of people, Jewish believers, Hebrew believers, who are thinking of turning back to the old legalistic system because of some of the pressure and stuff that was being applied against them. So they were thinking of going back and letting go of their freedom and their liberty in Christ, letting go of, of, of their faith in Jesus, letting go of, of what Jesus had done, and going back to this old legalistic system because there was pressure coming against them. We read in other letters where people, uh, they expected Jesus to return in their lifetime, and he wasn't. And so they're encouraging, no, you've got to persevere. You've got to keep believing. You've got to keep believing. We, we, we've, got to, we've got to get some sense of resilience and, and, and perseverance in our life. Because if we don't have perseverance and if we don't have resilience, you won't stand for Jesus. And I'm not just talking about out there in the public space. Because let me tell you where the greater battle takes place. It takes place privately in your own heart. It takes place privately in our own hearts. The people that we are, where nobody else is around. 
What we sow into when nobody's looking. When I'm at home by myself, when my wife's in bed, it's just me in front of the TV. When you're shopping and you know he's never going to see the statement. No resilience, no reaping, no perseverance, no prize. That's what Paul's saying to these people. But if we can just keep going, if we can just keep going, this is his encouragement. In due time, he says you'll reap a harvest. He says don't be deceived. Don't thumb your nose up at the truth of God that you will reap a harvest if, if you don't grow weary and if you don't give up. So maybe this morning there are some people here and maybe you've been praying for some things. Maybe you've been praying for some people. You've been praying for some stuff, praying for your kids. And let me encourage you. Don't grow weary. Don't grow weary this morning. Maybe you've been praying for your husband or your wife. Come to know God. Blinders to be taken off to see Jesus. Then keep praying. Maybe you've been believing for something and, and, and God's told you to just, just keep walking down a path or keep doing a particular thing and, and you're getting tired and weary and you're thinking, well, you know, when am I ever going to see that? Well, trust God. This is Paul's word to you this morning. Don't grow weary in doing good. Don't turn your nose up at God's promise today. Persevere. Be resilient. Keep trusting. Keep walking. Keep standing. Keep believing. Keep doing. In the words of the ancient prophet Dory, just keep swimming, just keep swimming this morning. Here's the promise. You are going to reap in due season if you don't lose heart, if you don't lose heart. Hey, we're going to finish up here. We've got tea and coffee next door. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to open up the front if anybody would like prayer this morning for anything. But can I encourage you here, if you're here this morning and you feel like maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking something to you, you don't have to come out the front for prayer. We do this because some people feel safe being prayed for by, by leaders and, and people. But we, our hands are no more anointed than anybody else's hands. The Holy Spirit, I believe, is here. And, and if so, you feel like the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. Can I encourage you? Why don't you go and grab somebody here this morning? Why don't you go and say, hey, look, here's the deal. This is what I feel like God is saying to me this morning. Hey, will you pray with me right now? Let's pray. Let's, let's seal that seed because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to get up, walk out the door, get in the car. By the time I get home, someone's going to cut me off in traffic. I'm going to do hand signals at them. And when I get home, I'm going to forget everything that the Holy Spirit was saying or it won't seem that important all of a sudden. The birds of the air will get snatched away. So can I encourage you, if God's speaking to you this morning, grab somebody here. Say, would you pray for me? Here's what I feel like the Lord's been speaking to me but don't give up persevere 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 let's get some resilience let's be a people of resilience and a people of perseverance amen father thank you for your word god thank you for your presence in this place lord thank you for uh god the death the burial and the resurrection of jesus lord we thank you god two thousand years ago you did something that was so incredibly powerful god so incredibly real and 2,000 years on, God, sometimes we do take that for granted and we get a bit blasé about it, Father. But I just pray, would you remind us, God, that you are that God that did miracles. You are all those things that we sang about before, Father. And Lord, for people here, Holy Spirit, whatever you've been saying to them, just pray this morning, Lord, would you just nudge them to not just get up and walk out and miss what could be a moment. This could be a due season for somebody this morning just to open up and to get prayer or to open up and speak to somebody. This could be your due season right now, Father. Don't let that person leave this place without talking to somebody, without being prayed for, Father. And God, as we leave this place today, God, for the next seven days, as we get back out to our jobs, workplace, marketplace, we do shopping, we play sport, go back to school. Lord, there are so many people that just do not know the reality of Jesus. And I pray for each of us, God, would you give us an opportunity in this next week to tell somebody about the goodness of God. Get us, give us a chance to tell someone about Jesus, Lord, somebody that doesn't know who you are, that needs you, Father. Give us that invitation, that opportunity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.